welcome to the latest episode of Fight Night Picks Significant Strikes. Matt, as always, we're getting excited for an event that we don't know if it's actually going to happen exactly. because with our last event, I mean, we did prediction videos for UFC 249. We went all the way through the prelims, through the main card, the five minutes for the main event. And listen, this wasn't all the way out so far as we did Ferguson and Habib. We got all excited for uh, Tony Ferguson taking on Justin Gaethje for the interim lightweight belt. And then what, less than 24 hours after we put the videos out, the event was pretty much scrapped. Now, we're gonna go a little bit blind into this one. Um, we've got UFC 249. If you go over on Tapology, they're still calling it 250, but at the top in the picture, it still says 249. Um, we have an event for May the 9th, so we're gonna get ramped up for it. We're gonna talk about it. None of these bouts have been confirmed. I wanna put that one out there right now. As of now, they're just rumored. Um, but Matt, this is a question that you asked me last night over text. People have asked me this question on Instagram, on Twitter, and on YouTube, where you can find me at Craig Allen FNP. We can find you at Matt Allen FNP. It's all pretty simple. And you can find the main uh, channel at Fight Night Picks. Your question to me was, what percentage of likelihood is it that we actually get this card? Where do you book it at? And where do you think this card's actually going to take place? So if WWE is an essential service in Florida, I don't know what the difference is between the behind the scenes as to what goes into making an event for the WWE compared to the UFC. Of course, I know a lot more about one sport than I do the other, but I wouldn't think it's that far off to be able to hold a UFC event if you're able to do wrestling because it's still pretty much the same thing. You have two people in a cage. Sometimes you have managers, aka coaches in MMA, and the logistics should work out if you can do WWE. So I think if they are able to find a venue in Florida, there's a good chance we will see this event actually going through. Vegas, though, is going to be weird. I don't know if even, like, even if they can do one not on a commissioned ground, if they can somehow do it on some sort of a reservation. But they tried doing that last time and it fell through. So, honestly, my hopes aren't really high for any place other than Florida right now. Yeah, and I mean, as of the time that we're taping this uh, episode, it's April the 19th or Sunday, where the day after UFC 249 was supposed to take place. Yeah, it kind of sucks. But uh, yeah, I know, listen, the news and everything, the cycle is kind of moving pretty quickly. Um, it's looking like tomorrow there's a couple of different states that are going to start to loosen some restrictions while keeping the the social distancing in place. I know Vermont was actually one of those states, which was kind of surprising because the state's that's closest to us uh, physically in terms of loosening restrictions. But it's looking like there's a few other states um, that are going to start to loosen restrictions. There's some states that don't have stay-at-home um, restrictions or requirements. And that's where, you know, there's some of those states that I figured maybe if UFC 249 was actually going to happen, maybe. I know South Dakota was one of them. There were a few more, but that was just one to kind of pick on. Um, where MMA's gone in the past. UFC's gone to South Dakota. Bellator has gone to South Dakota somewhat recently in the last couple of years. But in terms of UFC 250, if this card's actually to take place, and I, I said 250, but really it's 249, there's three title fights that are at the top of this card. There's fights where, you know, there's some... Th th let me start it off saying it this way. There's a lot of fighters on this card that people are going to recognize. It's okay. one of the most star-studded and biggest cards that we've seen in a really long time. But to go down through the list of the topics that we're going to touch on today... We're talking low-key fight of the night. We're talking rising stars, under-the-radar headlines, and unranked contender. And this is typically what we do with the significant strikes um, look or deep dive into an event. But usually the events aren't as stacked or as star-studded. So Matt, if we're looking low-key fight of the night, what's the one that maybe doesn't jump off the page in terms of views and eyeballs, but to you, it definitely makes a huge impact? Well, there's a couple, and one that we didn't even really know was scheduled until yesterday, really, with Anthony Pettis and Cowboy Cerrone. Really cool rematch. A rematch that you thought would have happened between, I think it's been seven years since their first fight, so kind of wild that those two never did get paired up in the meantime. But another one, too, that I don't think is getting enough credit, we had talked about it on the last card, too, Jacques Ray Souza versus Uriah Hall. Like, this fight, to me, is one of the more interesting ones, just to try to set up a potential... Because in every division, really, you kind of got three or four guys who all sort of had an argument for a title shot. If your Raya Hall can not only beat Jacare, but if you can finish him somehow, it's going to put him into that category. In, you know, the Jared Cannoneers, in the Edmund Shabazian, maybe. Just in that top, you know, five, six, he'll at least get himself in the queues so that one day maybe he can get a title shot if he can keep on getting wins together. But for me, that is my low-key fight of the night. And again, we're dealing with two guys who have headlined multiple UFC events in the past. So it is a wicked card. It's really hard to pick just one. And then for me, I'm kind of going to go with a fighter that a lot of people, the hardcores, 
are really starting to rally around. And you look at Edmund Shabazian, undefeated at middleweight, and I'm going to go with a guy in one of the lower weight classes that's still undefeated, and Bryce Mitchell, who's taken on Charles Rosa. And a lot of people are excited uh, with that fight. And it's kind of a weird matchup because if you look at Charles Rosa, he took a ton of time off between 2016 and 2019. It was almost a full three years. He was coming off a loss. He came into the fight against Manny Bermudez. It was a fight in Massachusetts with Kevin McDonald as a referee against Manny Bermudez. The stars were aligning for Massachusetts. And actually, it was a fight that saw Manny Bermudez ousted out of the UFC. And realistically, you look at a guy in Charles Rosa, it's a fairly fan-friendly style that'll bring to the table, but he also has really sneaky jiu-jitsu. And we saw it in that fight against Manny Bermudez where he kind of got dropped early in the first minute and a half or so. He was on his back, Bermudez was working from the guard, and then all of a sudden Rosa just kind of grabbed on his arm and was able to get that uh, armbar finish. So for Charles Rosa, he's taken on such a good jiu-jitsu fighter in Bryce Mitchell, who's quite a bit younger than he is. And if you look at the odds, it's minus 175 for Mitchell, which I'm fine with, but it's a really interesting fight. Like if I had to pick right now, I'd have to do a little bit more tape study. And it's it's pretty unfortunate that Rosa missed such a long amount of time. But he was a guy that came into the UFC. He was 9-0 and with every single fight a finish, and they were all in the first two rounds. I mean, in the UFC, he's 3-3. Three and three, And yeah, his, his debut was against Dennis Seaver, and he lost. Exactly. Um, but still, he, he's a really good kind of litmus test for a guy like Bryce Mitchell if you can kind of get a win over Charles Rosa look at that I wouldn't say the sky's the limit at 145 but definitely there's there's some good opportunities for thug nasty so for me that's the fight uh that that it's it's kind of a low-key fight of the night because you know if if Mitchell's able to win you're vaulting him into again maybe not stardom but he's right up there and I know in terms of rising stars that's our next topic who are you going with there Oh, Bryce Mitchell's 100% my rising star on this card. There's not a lot of uh, not a lot of other guys to really pick from, just because, like you said, it's such a recognizable card just off name value. But Bryce Mitchell, if you haven't watched him yet, he has like the excitement of like a Zabit striking, but on the ground. And there's never really a position uh, in really any grappling sequence that he can't find a submission from, because there's a lot of guys who. They get a few good positions. Uh, Phil Davis is a really good example. Kind of Linton Vassell, too. They're really good at that, like, head and arm choke position. They get on top. They're really heavy on top. But there's only a few places that they can really finish the fight from if they're really trying to. There's only a few submissions they can get to. Bryce Mitchell, it doesn't matter where you are. Full guard, half guard, on his back, on your back. He can be anywhere, and he's looking to finish the fight. So one of the more exciting young prospects, too. And I think if this card does end up going through, this is a perfect showcase for a fighter like Bryce Mitchell. Because, like you said, you're fighting on a card. All these other recognizable names. It's the only sport on TV right now if it does go through and I guess depending on what the other leagues do until May 9th but still it's kind of the perfect position for Bryce Mitchell to be in and if he can get a really big win against a guy like Charles Rosa like you said the sky's not the limit because beating a guy like Rosa it's not the biggest deal to the casual audience but to people like you and me who really follow the sport beating a guy like that and you said it perfectly it doesn't set you up you know sky's the limit but it proves that you do belong and that you know a guy in the top 15 should probably be next and let's let's kind of build on that too because i was talking about the fight with charles rosa so he's got three losses in the ufc the first one is a unanimous decision loss to dennis siever then he fought yari rodriguez and lost a split decision and then he went on to lose to shane burgos and it was a third round tko so those are again a lot of people are going to discount dennis siever but still this is a guy that fought bj penn this is a guy that fought Conor McGregor. Like, this is Dennis Seaver. And I know a lot of people oh, yeah. don't like him, but he was like a tiny Yoel Romero. Dennis Seaver. Still, for Fair Rising enough. Stars, I think a perfect pick um, is definitely Bryce Mitchell. And I'm going to go with another undefeated guy and a guy who, you know, coming out of the Massachusetts scene, we were able to see a lot of, especially the fact that we have fight footage with Fight Night Picks of Jorgen DeCastro. That's who I'm going with. At 6-0, and he's taking on Greg Hardy. And this is, again, this is a fight that's been moved from card to card to card. But still, if Jorgen DeCastro is able to get a win over a guy like Greg Hardy, that would put a lot of kind of chips in his hand, so to speak. Because oh. this, this is a fight that, for a time, was co-main event to UFC 249. When it was going to be Ferguson Gaethje, it was supposed to be DeCastro Hardy as the co-main with Ngannou and Rosenstrike as kind of the table setter on the prelims to get ready for a pay-per-view main card. And we were pretty critical about that. Joe Rogan and Brendan Schaub spent a lot of time on the JRE MMA show talking about the fact that Jorgen DeCastro Greg Hardy was the co-main. And they focused definitely very heavily on Hardy to the point where I don't think Brendan Schaub knew who Jorgen DeCastro was. 
But no, the fact that Jorgen DeCastro is a lights out striker, we saw it on his Dana White contender series. Um, I guess you could call it a debut because he only did have the one fight there. But a great finish there over an un- a fellow undefeated fighter. And then he comes into the UFC and he's taking on Justin Taffa. Matt, I know we talked about it a lot in our two-minute prediction that probably bled over into five or six minutes. The fact that Jorgen DeCastro's hands are on point there, but it's his use of the low kick, so much so that it's it's... It's so much better than a lot of the fighters that Greg Hardy's faced in the past. I mean, these are guys on, you know, the lower level regional scenes, the LFAs. Then he comes into contender series against uh, Austin Lane, a guy that wasn't really going to use it as much. And even against the pros that he's faced, the Alan Crowders, the Ben Sassolis, and to an extent, Alexander Volkov, just based on his length, he he can really bring his kicks up higher. But for Jorgen Castro, being just kind of the body type and the size that he is, he can employ that low kick to really set up the hands again, which we saw in the Taffa fight. And for me, you could consider him a rising star because if you're able to beat Greg Hardy, whether it's on the prelims or on the main card of a pay-per-view, it's such a big event. It's an undefeated guy and you're facing a former NFL pro bowler and a guy whose name, you can drag it through the mud or it can be in the headlines for all the right reasons. It's still a pretty valuable win if you're Jorgen Castro. A hundred percent. And we see this all the time when you're trying to build up a fighter in boxing is a lot more prevalent than in MMA, but it happens in MMA too. You want to give them different tests every single fight just to kind of see what they're good at, what they're not good at, what they can improve upon in the future. Your Castro is one of those big tests. We gave him uh, your boy there, the Kraken, who went for the really bad takedown and got TKO quick. And that didn't work out. So Greg Hardy passed that test. He's in the three-round club now, times two, I guess. I know one was no contest, needed the inhaler. The other time was against Volkov, which is pretty good. You're going to cash her, though. That leg kick problem is a really big problem that even guys in the top 10 of some divisions run into, and they never really get going from there. I mean, we saw Calvin Cater already in the top 15 fight Hinacho Moicano, and I know we're dealing with two guys who, just if we just look at their skills, they're much more skilled than these two, but there becomes a bit of a roadblock in everyone's career, and the low calf kick and that leg kick is a really big problem for a lot of guys, and for Greg Hardy, this could be a really interesting test. I think it was a really good pick. You're in a cash row guy who, and we've seen in the heavyweight division, there seems to be kind of like one guy every single year who goes from unranked to main eventing some sort of a fight night by the end of the year. And really, and it might be a little too much for Jorgen Castro at this moment, but he could be a guy if he goes out there and finishes Greg Hardy, then maybe gets another impression finish. By the end of the year, just depending on scheduling and everything with the events, he could be a guy in that, you know, top 15 to top 10 ranking. Like, we should definitely keep an eye out for Jorgen Castro. And I mean, this is a guy too, like people might forget, he was two and four as an amateur, and yeah. that was back in what uh 2017 like it's not that long ago that like we're talking about fights and you know we're gonna move on to under the radar headlines and and my pick but i'm gonna reference a fight from 2013 Jorgen castro was fighting as an amateur in 2017 it's crazy how time works especially with fighters like this and all of a sudden you find your groove and you're an undefeated pro fighting on possibly the co-main event well it's not now because we have three title fights but still you could be fighting the biggest fight of your life that quick so for Jorgen Castro great story a guy originally too from Cape Verde you don't hear from a lot of fighters from that uh, part of the world so a really good story and I really like what you said you never know with a couple of wins all of a sudden you're main eventing a fight night or something like that and you're a ranked contender so if Jorgen Castro rising star Bryce Mitchell as well a good story there um, and if we move into under the radar headlines, yeah, I know where I'm going to go with this. One of the ones that I would throw out there too, and I don't want to kind of step on your toes, is this fight even going to happen? That's not I, even I, an I, under the radar headline. And if it does, is it Fight Island soon to be trademarked? Is it the UFC Apex? Is it going to be somewhere in the Everglades of Florida, like in the middle of the water with with crocodiles or the, alligators? I have no I idea at this point. Exactly, and it's really weird. Like if you're the UFC, and maybe this is too early. Is Dana White really that necessary anymore? Because, like, I don't want to say that he's not. I know, but he's done a lot with the sport that I know I couldn't have. But, like, you had two billionaire friends growing up who bought you the UFC. And you did really well with it for as long as you could. But the UFC is not the thing he bought anymore. You know what I mean? It's a very different thing than what he had originally bought. And I understand what he's trying to do. The show must go on. He's got that – he still has that, like, small promoter mindset where he's like, okay, every event could be my last. So I have to keep on making sure I have content to pump out. But at a certain point, you're hurting a brand's name by trying to make these events right now. The reason the NBA and Adam Silver are so respected, really on a global scale, is because they're the ones who act first when anything happens. And I'm not just saying that uh, to do with this recent corona, you know, 
uh, outbreak. But every single time anything happens in the world, the NBA, more likely than not, is the first people to come and speak out about it. They're very socially conscious that way, if you will. And that's what it has to do with their global popularity. So maybe at this point, and Daniel Cormier had said potentially he'd be interested in it after he retires. If DC could one day somehow take over the keys to the UFC, I think it would be in such good position. It's not even funny. Like, that's my perfect UFC route. Dana White retires when DC retires, and DC takes his spot. I think, and it's tough due to uh, prior convictions for money laundering, um, but Chael Sonnen would be my pick for president. And, and that's a great pick, too. There's a lot of former fighters out there who would do a great job. Guys or, like Michael, or, or guys even like if Michael. if you could somehow poach Rich Franklin away from one championship oh and put him goodness. into the UFC, like, there's there's a lot of really good picks. I think DC, Sonnen, and uh, Rich Franklin would be really All good picks. picks. But realistically, I, I agree with you to an extent as well. I mean, it's one of those spots where, and I know in the States, like, there was talk Dana White and Vince McMahon are going to help out um, with the president in terms of kind of bringing sports and normalcy, excuse me, back to the world. And I know up here in Canada, um, Gary Bettman was going to meet up with the prime minister and there were a couple of different sports leagues. And I saw as well, you know, NFL, NBA, everybody was kind of going to kind of lead the charge, so to speak, in bringing normalcy and bringing sports back. But for Dana White, He's been out there for weeks. It's It's been over a month right now championing the fact that the UFC has to happen. And I know a lot of people, fans of you know MMA on YouTube, fans of MMA on Twitter, don't like the fact that these fights aren't happening. And I don't like it either. Like, I have to say that. As an MMA media member, as a member, like, you can come and take shots at me as a member of the MMA Journalist Association, which I am. A lot of people are very critical of MMA media. But what do you want these people to do? Do you want them to report on the news? I mean, the New York Times is the one that said it's actually going to be a touchy palace. Like, there were MMA media members that said it first, but when the New York Times said that, it really popped off. So is is the guy that wrote the article for the New York Times, is he this creepy MMA media member that, you know, doesn't have to worry about feeding his family, as it's been said? And, you know, there's a lot of not they're not misconceptions there's a lot of bad things out there right now about mma media that just well and it's odd too because you would never see in any other sport like fans or other athletes booing the media for the questions they ask like i watch a lot of basketball and there's never a post-game press conference where like you know the players are talking back towards the reporters it happens in mma almost every single event though yeah and i mean it it does happen in other pro sports i mean it like not, I'll, I'll give you an ex- the level. no but you know you'll see coaches kind of get rattled by a question and go back and forth but in mma if you ever really do watch watch a post-fight presser watch a, a pre-fight presser i mean i'll give you an example matt doesn't like when i do this but if we go back to ufc moncton I asked Artem Lobov a question about uh, his camp and he kind of barked back at me, but it was, it was more or less, you know, he was posing, he was getting ready for this fight and he wasn't on the best of streaks at that point. So he kind of had to make enough rah, rah for himself. But if you ever watch a post fight press conference, there's very rarely any kind of a dust up. They're pretty well softball questions. But in all of the pre-fight stuff, that's almost why they do it to a certain degree is to draw attention to it and a little bit of controversy. And again, MMA is the only sport you're ever going to see that in. That was my only point. Yeah, it's it's just an odd spot. So for under the radar headlines, yeah, we don't know where the event's going to take place. It's tentatively scheduled for the Apex Center, but you never know. It could be in Florida. It could be on Fight Island, you know, Tachi Palace, maybe, but probably not. But for me, I'm going to spin it a totally different way. And we've already talked about this, but my under the radar headline is the fact that we're going to get a rematch that's over seven years in the making with Pettis and Cerrone 2. I have a question for you about that fight, but keep on going. I went back and watched that fight from 2013, and it was Anthony Pettis. It was a number one contenders fight. It wasn't even the main or the co-main on the card that it was on. It was UFC on Fox 6. Demetrius Johnson was uh, fighting for the belt in the main event, which is kind of crazy. And it was such uh, a good fight because it was one that at the time in 2013 had already been scheduled before. It was one of those ones that it was already supposed to happen. Donald Cerrone said that Pettis pulled out. Pettis was kind of coy about it. And then after the fight, it was supposed to happen again, and then it never really did. And Pettis in that fight looked amazing. I mean, it was the body kicks that actually did the job. He hit him with one solid. Cerrone kind of tensed straight up. And then all of a sudden, Pettis was kind of going high, high, low with the punches. And then finally, he softened him up again with the body kick. And that was all she wrote. After that fight, Pettis got a shot at the belt and won the belt. And for Donald Cerrone, he'd win a fight 
um, over KJ Noons, who I hold in very high regard. Then he loses to RDA, and then he went on an eight-fight win streak in yeah. two years for his next shot at the belt against RDA again, only to lose. So kind of his card tonight. Yeah, it was kind of tough, but still. Um, our yeah. commission suspensions, though, if Cowboy's allowed to fight. Didn't he break his orbital, like, a month ago? And has he broke every bone in his body? I don't want to try to be so negative, but that was the first thing I thought of when I saw this fight got booked. Cowboy just got off breaking his orbital and just had another knockout loss. He's had three in a row now. And I know the Ferguson one wasn't really a knockout loss, if you will. He took so much damage in that fight, though. So you fight Justin Gaethje, Tony Ferguson, Conor McGregor, and then Anthony Pettis. Like, I've got nothing but absurd amounts of respect for Donald Cerrone because he only fights, like, the best of the best. And he is willing to fight anyone. Like, he's one of the few people who genuinely mean that when they say it. Like, he will fight anyone regardless of weight class, whatever day it is. But at a certain point, and I know we've been saying this his whole career— and maybe it should have been said years ago, you can't let this guy keep on losing to this level of fighters after a certain point. And I know Pettis is coming off the Fahea loss, so maybe they think they're getting Pettis at a pretty good point in his career. But still, it's a risky fight when you know what Pettis is able to do. And let's say Cowboy does go out there and get stopped by Pettis again. What do you do with him after that? That's four stoppages in a row. Like I just think you need to ease up on his scheduling a little bit here at a certain point. Like, I mean, it's crazy if you look at Anthony Pettis, and I know a lot of people, geez, I mean, since 2014, people haven't been overly high on Anthony Pettis. I'm one of the few that has, because if you look at the strength of schedule, so to speak, after that, loses to RDA, then he loses a split to Eddie Alvarez, then he loses to Edson Barboza in a decision. I mean, those are really tough guys at 155. Then he beats Charles Oliveira by submission. Then he loses to Max Holloway. That's fine. I don't know why he went back down to 145 in the first place. Then he fights Jim Miller, gets a win. Then he loses to Poirier by submission, but still at the same time, he did hurt the rib. So I'll dis not discount it, but yeah, I will a little bad. bit. Like that fight was pretty one-sided. Though. Then he submits Michael Chiesa. Was- don't forget about that. I know it was at 55 in case it was a little depleted, but still. Then he loses to Tony Ferguson in a fight that he had success in at the oh, time. Yeah. I mean... Ferguson poured it on in the second round, but still. Then he knocks out Wonder Boy. Then he fights Nate Diaz, and that was a weird fight. And then yeah, he loses. Bad, yeah, he did. And then he loses to our boy Carlos Diego Fajaya. So it's one of those spots where it's weird because now Pettis again moving back up to seventy. Cerrone's been at seventy for a while. You're getting two guys that they're not. They're definitely not in their primes. I no, mean, exactly. And Anthony Pettis is only 33 years old. It's kind of weird. Here's to say my question: that. Is the loser of this fight Bellator's next lightweight champ? I don't. Th- no, uh, not a lightweight. Not and a I- lightweight champ, but you know what I mean. Like, if Pettis loses this, are we going to see Pettis versus Douglas Lima next year? Like, could I don't think Cowboy gets cut no matter I, what. I think I, he's got a really good relationship with Don or with uh, Dana White. The fans really like him, but Pettis hasn't even been like that popular for years now. Like it's been a while since Pettis has even been popular. Cowboy, you can at least say his skills have diminished, but popularity wise, Cowboy Cerrone is still one of the more popular guys in the UFC. I'd like to see it where Cowboy kind of takes, and again, it's a common opponent or a guy that he's faced in the past. I'd like to see him take the Matt Brown approach and just take some time just off. Don't call, it. don't call it a retirement, but just take some time off. Handpick an opponent that maybe isn't like Diego Anthony Sanchez. Pettis level, not Diego Sanchez, but somebody maybe even an up and comer. But you know, there's not that much shine. But I'd like to see Anthony Pettis uh, in Bellator. I think it'd be a breath of fresh air. I think at 170, a fight with a guy like even. Lorenz MVP. Larkin, I don't think he wins, but MVP, yeah, that's that's fine. Because, I mean, MVP, they've been building him up. He's faced, you know, former UFC guys in the past. So you could do something like that. But for Pettis, I think having the two Pettis brothers in Bellator with Sergio having a chance at the belt at 35 and Anthony with a chance at either 55 or 70, I think a fight between Anthony Pettis and Michael Chandler is a fight that would sell. But what do I know? Bellator sales model is a little weird. But for under the radar headlines, at least it's getting us talking because I think Pettis and Cerrone, the fact that it's a rematch, people may not even realize that because it was seven years ago. It was over seven years ago. It's a really exciting one um, that just kind of jumps off the page when you already have three title fights up at the top. I mean, we could be talking about the fact that, listen, Jose Aldo was on two losses getting a title shot. Now you have Dominic Cruz that hasn't fought since 2016 coming off a loss to get a chance at Henry Cejudo. But that will save for another day. For unranked contender, this is tough, and I'm going to spit off, and I know that I already know that we're going to agree um, yeah. who we're going with. And we're both going with the same person here. I'm going to spit off a list of unranked people that are fighting on this card. Charles Rosa, Bryce Mitchell, Nico Price, Jacare Souza. At middleweight, he's unranked. At light heavyweight, he is ranked. Uh, Greg Hardy, Jorgen Castro, 
Donald Cerrone is ranked six at lightweight, but he's not ranked at welterweight. Um, and then there's that's that's it. That's it for unranked uh, guys. There's one unranked fighter on this card that's a former champion <laughs> that I thought was going to have a long title reign. Um, this is a guy that ended Fedor Emelianenko's ten year win streak. Then a firefighter from Cleveland knocked him out in his hometown. Yeah. It was a weird fight too. Like it was weird energy. It was the, the it was the same type of energy when Yancey Madero's fought uh, Cowboy Cerrone, and he was kind of like feeling it, and then he went out there and get knocked out in the first round. Who's that guy? Kind of. Yeah, a little bit, but like Stipe's also the goat, so show him a little respect. So Matt doesn't want to say who it is, but it's Fabrizio. Oh, Fabrizio Verdum. Verdum. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't know you were waiting for me. Fabrizio Verdum. Okay, are we gonna say that he did fail a drug test, or was he proven innocent? Because it's one of those weird John Jones things where he failed a drug test, but maybe gave you some some information, which reduced his sentence. So I don't even know how we're supposed to go at this in the first place. But Verdum on a skill level, and especially in the heavyweight division, we talk about how shallow it is. If you forget about the Volkov loss, and if that fight never happened, I would say throw Verdum in there with, you know, Overeem, throw him in there with Ngannou, anyone in the top of that division, and he fits right in. The Volkov loss is a weird one, though, because A, he got tired, and we've never really seen that before. We've seen him get tired, but never to that degree, and especially never against someone on the level of Volkov. No respect to Volkov, but it's not like you're fighting a steep in the when you're fighting Alexander Volkov. And that fight really worried me. But really, I mean, when you look at the heavyweight division right now, there's not many guys in that top 15 who you can definitively say, oh, yeah, they'd be the favorite over Fabrizio Verdum. I mean, you look at Fabrizio Verdum, and he had poor Travis Brown's number twice. But still, like, you look at the wins and the losses. Okay, he wasn't supposed to fight Walt Harris. He was supposed to fight Derek Lewis. And on incredibly short notice, he takes on Walt Harris and just kind of... Less than a day. Yeah, he dilly dallies into an arm bar less than, or just over a minute into the fight. Then he fights Mercin Tabora and beats him mercilessly into a decision. And then, yeah, I mean, his last fight was Volkov, which was really weird. Like, it was a fight that I know he was a favorite in that fight. I'm going to look it up. He was a minus 210 favorite. I was super high on a win in that fight, maybe getting a title shot again, but it didn't happen. Um, and then, I mean, before that, we're going back to 2017 UFC 2. 13 Romero Whitaker won where he lost Alistair Overeem but yeah you're right like if you put Fabrizio Verdum up against Shamil Durkimov Curtis Blades put him up against even Kurt like going as high up That's as Curtis good. Blades and the thing too about Fabrizio Verdum he's 42 years old like he turns 43 this year if I'm Curtis Blades I call for that fight like there's no tomorrow because you're probably not getting a title shot ahead of Francis even though Francis scheduled for a few weeks but still you're not going to jump the queue and Verdum, you want to get him fresh. I wouldn't want him to have that one warm-up fight against, let's say, an Augusto Sakai and then let him really get back. Not 100%, because like you said, he's a little bit older, but 42 for a heavyweight's not that bad. So if you can get Verdum right away coming off his suspension, I think that's the perfect time to get him. Now, he's probably going to run over Olenek, which is bad news for Curtis Blades, who's going to be fresh by the time he fights Blades if they do make that fight, but that'd be perfect. I mean, thing. realistically, and we're talking unranked contenders, in a fight against Alexei Olenek, who's coming off a win over Maurice Green, um, yeah. it's it's a weird one, because Olenek's a guy that's fought a middleweight in the past. I know he's been a heavyweight for quite Not some sure. time. Quite some, and Bodog fights, Fight Island, but if you look at Olenek, he's fought at heavyweight for a long time, but you look at the size, reach, and everything. Verdum's a lot bigger of a guy. He's I, I know Olenek's great at getting into good positions, and his jiu-jitsu is very good. But you're not fighting a... He's not for Parisi. You're not Verdum. fighting a, a low-level fight IQ guy, so to speak. Like... Again, Junior Albini to jump into his guard. Fabrizio Verdum's not going to make mistakes like that on the ground. So the only way for Olenek to win is with the hands. And you're not, you don't have the size advantage that a guy like uh, Volkov or an Overeem's had in the past. And you have to focus on the fact that Marcin Tabora is pretty good at grappling. He's pretty good at wrestling. Um, yeah, Verdum was able to run over him. So I see Verdum winning that fight hands down against Olenek. And then the question, yeah. you're right, is well, what's next? And if Here's a weird question. Yeah. Oh. Do you think he can submit Olenek? Yeah, I, I really do. Okay, I just, when I think of that fight, I'm thinking it's more likely he would, like, ground and pound him, but 
if he could submit him, he's definitely going to win. I, yeah, I think Verdum's going to win that fight. The only guys who give Verdum trouble at this stage in his career are those guys like, you know, the all-timers, the steep A's, the overings. Like, it takes a big effort to beat that guy. Yeah, I think, you know, there's all sorts. There's, there's there's pretty well one way that Alexei Olenek is going to beat a guy like Fabrizio Verdum. And, again, we're talking former common opponents. Uh, the only guy I can think of is Travis Brown, where he kind of knocked him down and then finished him, like submitted him. Yeah. But if if you're focused on fighting a guy like Fabrizio Verdum, his Muay Thai is very I wouldn't even say underrated because you know how good it is. So Half you've got Cordero, Yeah, you've got a guy that's very, very well rounded against a guy who yeah, again, he beat Maurice Green, but Maurice Green's not a former UFC no. heavyweight champion. So for unranked contender, I think it's definitely more than fair to say Fabrizio Verdum. He's one of those guys that he'll jump off the page, but you might not think due to the fact that he's an unranked guy and, and yeah. he still has a possibility of becoming a contender, especially with a win over Olenek that's kind of hung around. He had that moment when he was supposed to face and did face um, Alistair Overeem where he was kind of starting to climb the rankings with wins over Junior Albini and Mark Hunt. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's my guy. Apart from that, Matt, is there anything on this card that's kind of flying under the radar that we're not really focusing on, that's not really getting a lot of attention? So the title fight of Felicia Spencer and Amanda Nunes, that was supposed to be scheduled for later on in the year. They pushed it way up to have it so that it is May 9th. It's a really weird fight, especially for Felicia Spencer. I know you want to give the 145 belt a little bit of, I don't know, just legitimacy, but I don't think that's the fight to make. I really do think they're killing off a contender way too early. I would make her Megan Anderson, and I know what you're going to say, there's only four fighters in the division, so you know, a contender has to get to the top at some point, but I would let that division, if you will, really cook over time, like really let them try to build a contender, because you're dealing with, it's not like they're just fighting, you know, champion X. You're fighting the greatest fighter ever at your weight class, and you're just throwing all these women who aren't nearly close to being ready. Like, Felicia Spencer's a good grappler she's big for the weight class but she's not better than amanda at any single thing in mma so i just don't see where the path of victory is for her. i think it's an interesting fight i'm glad to see that amanda nunez is defending the 145 pound belt i think it's cool that she's one well she's the only champ champ that has actually been like okay i'll defend both belts i think that's very neat i'm a big amanda nunez fan though but it's just an interesting fight, I guess, and I feel bad for Felicia Spencer. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of trivia. Um, I don't know if you saw the tweet that was thrown out there by Aaron Bronstetter yesterday. He said, who's the only manager in MMA that has two uh, or d- that has um, different current champions in the UFC? More than one. Either Malky Kawa or Ali Abdelaziz. It's Dominance MMA, Ali Abdelaziz, and there's one other one. No idea. It's Nina Ansarov. Really? That's <laughs> Nina Ansaroff is the other manager that has two champions <laughs> or, or one or more in the UFC with Amanda Nunes. Now, we've talked about this in the past, and I've harped on it quite a bit with uh, John Franklin on Early Stoppage, which you can now find on Fight Name Picks. But I, it's, it's, to me, it's disappointing the women's featherweight division in the UFC. Yeah. And it's not anybody's fault. It's not, it's not the fighter's fault in the UFC. They're incredibly talented, and a lot of people might not like that. But... I think they are. I think Megan Anderson and Felicia Spencer are good talents. They really are. It's just the fact that, again, you're talking a small term or or a small promoter might think this way. Like, I've seen fights before on smaller promotions where they're going to have a cruiserweight title fight just for fun. They don't have a division. They're just going to do it for fun. You're going to cash or did it in NEF. I've seen things happen on the regional scene. You'll see catchweight fights at 160 or 165. They don't actually have a division there. They're just making the fights to have the fights. The UFC has this women's featherweight division just so they can have a champ champ. And it's awesome. Amanda Nunes is a generational talent. And again, oh. I think she's a pound for pound top five regardless of gender. And I, you can argue that. I think it's true. She's the best women's fighter of all time. She's beaten every single current or former champion in two different awesome. weight classes in the UFC. So you're the best of the best. You're the cream of the crop. But I think what the UFC is doing with Spencer and Anderson is they're just safeguarding those two talents so that they don't go elsewhere. So that they're not back in Invicta or they don't go to Bellator because Bellator continues to build up a stable of fighters at 145 that maybe they don't rival the UFC, but at least they're putting on the fights. They've got fighters like Leslie Smith, who's incredibly competitive. They now have Kat Zingano. Pretty excited to see that debut. You're getting a pretty big name with the title. And, of course, Cyborg. Chris Cyborg and Julia Budd and yeah, Olga Rubin and fighters. on and on and on. They continue to build up this division. And at least for the fighters that go up and face, again, 
those names that I brought up, they're probably going to still stick around for at least one or two more fights because it's so hard to find women that weigh in the featherweight division. And even Kayla Harrison has come out and said here recently that she'd consider dropping down a weight class or she'd at least entertain the thought. And maybe, you know, if you're Dana White, you're licking your lips and hoping you can get a generational talent like a Kayla Harrison. But still, I just, it's a weird spot having that division. And like you said, the fact that they moved this fight up, Spencer going in against Nunes, Spencer's already faced Chris Cyborg, and it didn't go her way. If I'm not mistaken, it went to a decision. It did, did. And she did well in that fight. It's just, if you do poorly against Cyborg, you're fighting the prime Cyborg right now. Like, I get Cyborg's a little bit older, and you can say she's not in her prime. I don't think she is in her prime. You're basically fighting a woman who does everything prime Cyborg does, but she's also amazing at wrestling and a black belt jiu-jitsu and uses those things. Everyone likes to say, oh, Chris Cyborg's a black belt. When was the last time you saw her actually use her jiu-jitsu? doesn't and, need like, to because she sets it up with no, the hands. But Amanda Nunes has the power in her hands, and it's not that she doesn't need to. She uses every single weapon that she has, and no matter what weapon she has, it's still better than anything else in that division. Like, I don't think Amanda, I think Amanda Nunes should at least be a minus 700 for both the Megan Anderson fight and the Felicia Spencer fight. That's how one side I think both those fights would be. It's going to be a rough go. And we have three title fights scheduled, supposedly rumored, unconfirmed at Look the at top. Happens. I mean, the fact that you have Dominic Cruz taking on Henry Cejudo. And a lot of people are going to say and side with Cejudo. And I'm sure we will when the time comes. But the fact that he's been off for now almost a year, it'll be... 11 months by the time the fight hopefully happens. Um, the last time that he fought against Marlon Moraes back in June of last year. Then he had shoulder surgery. Dominic Cruz, it's just a body of injuries. And I, I don't mean to say that, but still. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in that fight. And of course, your main event that continues to drag out. And realistically, right now, I wish it wasn't going to happen. I'd still sooner have Tony and Habib. If you waited an extra month, yeah. why, why not wait? a little bit longer and still have Cejudo, Cruz, and Nunes and Spencer. You can sell a card easily and then oh, wait yeah. for Tony and Habib. And this is another thing off the Joe Rogan MMA show, the fact that Brendan Shaw continued to say that Ramadan, it was in August. It's not in August. It's in March and April. It's not in <laughs> August. Um, so if you look at Habib, Ugh, he takes time yeah. off at the end of the spring into the early summer. He, you know, have a full training camp june and july and then in august you make that fight so that's that's it's almost like that's how his schedules always work to be well, that's but. that's what you should hope for if you're an mma fan and maybe you get gaichi and, and or gaichi or ferguson but again they're probably going to take uh, a lot of damage they're probably going to need a lot of flex seal to heal the wounds but listen we're really looking forward to it whether it's ufc 249 250 you could be fighting what on happened? mars we're going to cover it we're really looking forward to it matt we can find you on twitter and instagram at matt all fmp do you have anything exciting going on this week not really no just hoping this quarantine ends any day now i look more like a cult leader every day i see because now i have a ponytail so yeah it's been tough hopefully this ends soon and i'm sure this was uh, the highlight of your week you can always find me Pretty on much. twitter and instagram at craig allen fmp you can find the main channel at fight night picks we'll be back again later on this week with some more content we're continuing to churn those out and i've got a big reveal to come up uh, at some point this week um, joining another organization. So stay tuned for that. Again, you follow us on the socials. And also be sure to check out uh, some of the other content here on Fight Night Picks. We've got parry and counter questions, so continue to drop those in the comments. I know a lot of people have been doing it throughout the week. We haven't been uh, churning out a lot of those videos, but we will have some of that content coming out this week. And uh, yeah, continue to hit us up with that. And as always, Matt, like we like to say with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it.